And even there, it's not doing like that announcement, right? Or no, that's only if. Right, right, because because no, because I pressed record on the chapel laptop. It, it won't announce it, you know. It won't announce it anyway. Um, Disconnect from the projector and reconnect. Can you hear me, testing Jim? No, no, nothing. No. No. no, nothing to the computer. He's muted. Yeah, he just muted himself. I'm unmuted now and I'm talking. There's a little bit of a lag, but I don't know. Can you guys hear me now? No, testing. No, we see we see your microphone going up and down, so it's recognizing it, but it's just not going through. Well, we'll figure it out. We don't need it yeah. for today, but um, I, I think Larry Dixon is really the next time right. that we need it. They're playing the video. Does this video play through the sound? Oh, is John, is John playing a video today? I thought there's a VBS video. Oh, try a video. So you can play. Ah. Yeah, you want to try to play like a YouTube video on here? All right. I'll, uh, I'll hang up, Jim. Um, All right. Oh, yeah, we'll work on it. All right. Bye. Can we try to just disconnect from the projector and reconnect? It's this audio setting. See, there's no, there's no. Uh... What is it? Because it's. Yeah. That was something. Yeah. Wait a check? sec. Now we know how to cut Joey off. Oh. Oh, if you're speaking remotely. You want me to you want me to speak through here? Testing, testing, one, two, testing, one, two. No, no. It's coming through the chapel uh, the laptop speakers. You heard you heard that coming through? It went through the laptop speakers though. Like you heard it coming out of this? Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's not connecting with was the audio maybe the audio gun. Do you care if I just disconnect from the projector and reconnect? Can you play sound through this like a video? Yeah. Yes. Hold on, sorry, because I think we might have a, a video to. Oh, yeah. Weird. Although I imagine, but it's something with Joe. 
Now it's the audio from here to there. Oh, there you go. So what happened? We're watching City of Angels. I know, I'm trying to pull up a quick two Thank you. Okay. So should we should be good. Oh, you should oh, yeah. I, I asked him about uh, no. Oh, is he there anyway? Where is he? Oh, Joel is there. So any, any, for future reference, anything that... Uh, I don't know. I just restarted that okay. and maybe reconnected. And I did pull all the connectors out. Okay. Hey, can you unmute Julie's computer and just try again? We, we think it's working. Yeah, you're not connected anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Can you talk? Yeah. Yes, you're good. Yeah. I mean, she she just made a noise, so I don't know if she's like saying anything. But say like a word, like a. Can you hear me? How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You're good. You're good. I was making noise. It was coming through my phone. Yeah, we're good. We're good. No, that no, it works. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you. Bye. Ask John. You don't know if John's doing a PowerPoint, do you? I'm saying Luke 510. I like wrestling. Yeah. 
นะAre you okay leading an announcement from up here? Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask John about where he wants to sit. Okay. Blah, blah. Blah, blah. Uh, uh,
uh, going on. Why is it here? But oh, welcome and to finish. Well, living hope. who set me free hallelujah death has gone to sin on me you have broken every chain new salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory hallelujah its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah broken your name Jesus Christ my living hope Heavenly Father we thank you that Jesus Christ is our living hope who is the one that has set us free that death no longer has a grip on us and that we can walk in freedom in Christ we thank you Lord so much that uh, we're we have hope uh, if the resurrection were not true, we would be the most miserable people in the world. But thanks be to God, Jesus is risen from the dead. 
he is alive and we have hope and we have purpose. Lord, you have given us spiritual gifts. You have given us the body of Christ, the church, to serve and to love one another together. Lord, help us to exemplify that living hope to one another day in and day out. Help us, Lord, as we hear from your word this morning. Uh, we pray for our brother, John, that you would empower him by your spirit to speak the words of eternal life, uh, to challenge us and to equip us for the work of the ministry. And Lord, if there's anyone here that has not yet chosen to follow the Lord Jesus, that today would be their day uh, that they choose Christ and live for him. We pray that uh, you would convict us of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and that you would show us the path of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, uh, that there is a way forward for us, that there is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this time that we have together to hear from your word. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn the meeting over now uh, to our brother, John Peasland, who will be sharing God's word with us. Good morning. All right, I'm glad to see your energy level is about the same as mine this morning. <clears throat> And as you can hear, my voice is not normal. It's because it's carnival time. And at carnivals, you shout and you yell to the kids and you lose your voice. And don't think about the fact that you're supposed to speak on Sunday morning. <clears throat> so I apologize for the voice. Hopefully it uh, will get stronger with use and not weaker. Um, we had a great, great time this week uh, just hearing from our kids. Uh, what the carnival was all about. I must confess, I don't think I'd ever celebrated the Lord's Supper in a circus tent before. <laughs> I've, I've done it in some pretty strange places, but never in a circus tent. Um, but it was, a, it was a great week, and it was great to see the Lord working in lives. So last week was VBS week, I, I'm told, because I was up in Sunday school, so I, didn't, I wasn't actually here. Um, and so if last week was a VBS theme, this week will be Sunday school theme, if that's all right with you. I was supposed to teach Sunday school, but I got a replacement, and so now you get my Sunday school class. <clears throat> and quite appropriately so, because there's some passages in Scripture, I'm not sure if this happens to you, but we hear about them as kids in Sunday school, we hear the stories, and then we kind of don't hear about them again. Maybe we teach them in Sunday school. But we we kind of do the high level this is what the story this is how the story goes but when you dig into the details of some of these stories there's tremendous truth for us and our generation as well and so today i'd like to dig in very briefly as you'll know once you know the topic into the lies of elijah and elisha yeah both in one message i know that's a challenge but Hey, since you were busy this week with VBS, I'm sure you can spend a little extra time today listening, <laughs> listening to the message. No, I'll try, to, I'll try to get you out in time. And what I'd like to look at from Elijah and Elisha is something that I'll call, and I totally made up this thing. I don't think I heard it anywhere, um, this term, what I'm calling generational discipleship generational discipleship well, what's that it's it's one generation discipling the next generation uh one individual that's serving in a ministry preparing the next the person that will come behind to take on that ministry it's it's just like that replication cycle that we see in the great commission of evangelizing sharing the gospel making disciples establishing local churches that share the gospels and establish look it's supposed to happen that way replication unfortunately it doesn't always happen that way does it and it's that's true also with generational discipleship and uh and so i'd like to challenge ourselves a little bit from the from the lives of elijah and elisha this morning i'm going to take advantage of the fact that i'm hoping that you paid attention in sunday school or at least you've heard of these two individuals and I won't go into too much detail about some of the stories that I make reference to, but I trust that this will be beneficial to your lives. Let's just commit our time to the Lord. Father, as always, we ask for your presence. We ask for you to speak. We ask for your word to change lives, for your, for your word to impact our hearts and our lives. 
as we consider it this morning. May this be a blessed time, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to chapter 2 of 2 Kings. So if 1 Kings wraps up with Elijah, 2 Kings jumps into Elisha, and, and chapter 2 is that transition point. And we're going to spend a little bit of time there in just a little bit. But I'd like to just briefly talk about some of the contrasts and similarities or comparisons that we can make between these two men. I'll start with some of the similarities in their lives, the similarities between Elijah and Elisha. Both were appointed by God, right? They, just, they didn't just one day decide that they were going to be prophets of Israel. They were both appointed by God. They were both empowered by God to do extraordinary things. They did things that I don't do, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in, in a little bit. They both served the Lord as prophets of the northern kingdom of Israel. Not sure how many northern kingdom. Most of the prophets that were prophets that wrote books of the Old from Judah or the southern kingdom, but not so with Elias. And in compared to other prophets, what we find in scripture is a focus on their methods or their actions or message that they are providing or they're delivering uh, to the people of Israel, which is an interesting comparison. Hands it over or passes the mantle to Elisha, and we find the same power or maybe even increased as uh, Elisha requests. But the man, the prophet, for God. Methods and mentality, however, were very different. And I'll use that to move into a much larger piece of looking at their lives of contrast. They were much, very different individuals. Socioeconomic differences uh, are, were drastic. Elijah, from what we can tell, was from a rustic area in Gilead, probably from a poor home. Whereas Elisha, when we find him, if you'll remember that story, when Elijah comes to place his mantle upon him, he's plowing the field with not just donkey, not with one ox. Does anyone remember how many oxen he had? Twelve yoke. So at that time, didn't have that many animals or the luxury of doing this. He must have been from a pretty well-to-do family. So there was a, a vast difference from their background or, or upbringing. There was a personality difference. And this, how they got together, how they spent those years that they spent of discipleship, how personality. Elijah was an extrovert, and he was given to emotional swings. He was constantly going from euphoria to depression. It was, wow, everything's going great, and the king, God is the king of Israel, and then, oh, I'm the only prophet left, and he was down in the dumps and wanted to die. That's Elijah, whereas Elisha seems to be an introvert, kind of a quiet guy. No real evidence that we can see in Scripture probably much more even temp. I'm not sure how that went. Their physical appearance, as we can see in 2 Kings, was quite different as well. Elijah, in 2 Kings 1.8, he's called a hairy man. That's how they describe him. Well, who was it? Oh, well, it was a hairy man with a belt. That's how they describe Elijah. But then for Elisha, they make fun of him, calling him baldy. Right? The, the kids would mock him and say, oh, baldy. Apparently, he must have had some lack of hair on the top of his head. So two contrasts there as well. But then maybe more importantly, there's differences in their ministries. Elijah's ministry, or Elisha's ministry, lasted twice as long as Elijah's, spanning four kings and 40 to 50 years versus two and maybe a piece of a, of a third a king with Elisha and only 20 to 30 years. So almost twice as long for Elisha versus Elijah. 
if we look at the king's uh, first and second king's narratives depends how you count i realize uh, this is dangerous telling how many miracles an individual did because then you know you start counting certain things as miracles and not others but approximately seven miracles for elijah versus 14 or 15 of elisha so almost double or around double for elisha versus elijah which is interesting considering his request of the do double portion in 2 Kings 2.9. But Elijah's ministry was more dominant. It was more flamboyant. It was more out in the front of the entire kingdom, whereas Elisha's was much more uh, behind the scenes, person to person conversations, that kind of ministry. Their interpersonal dealings, Elijah dealt with powerful worldly figures, right? So he was out there with Ahab and Jezebel and Ahaziah, and he was talking publicly to them in front of hundreds and thousands of people, whereas Elijah dealt mainly with common people, and he spoke with the widow and with the laborer and the Shunammite. And even when Naaman comes, you'll remember that story of the captain, the commander of the the armies of Syria, Naaman has leprosy and he's seeking help and he comes to the house of Elisha. This is Elisha's opportunity to be the man, right? This is his Elijah moment to stand out there and do some sort of wave of the hand and you are healed by the power of God. Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He sends his servant and he goes out the back door. Elisha's not, not Elijah. He's very different in the way that he deals with people. In their miraculous deeds, Elijah's miracles were very dramatic. Judgment on apostasy, judgment. Elijah's miracles were, were quite modest and he people them happen. Maybe the, the stories were told after all the people standing around. He cleansed the waters of Jericho. He supplied oil. He cleansed food. He fed 100 men. Uh, one of the stories, uh, kind of a predecessor to the multiplication of the bread and the fish. Here he multiplied the bread to, to feed those 100 men. Uh, he cured a Gentile, Naaman, of leprosy, and he recovered an axe head. I mean, real, real big stuff. Right? He made an axe head float. So there's, there's differences also in the miraculous deeds that they did. You know, Elisha was always in Elijah's shadow. Even after Elijah's departure, interesting to see, Elisha was known as Elijah's servant. Chapter 3, verse 11. They refer to Elisha as Elijah's servant. And here's where I'll start making some application. I don't know if it's ever happened to you where you're called by someone else's name. Are any of you that way? You know, where I'm not John, I'm Tom Peaslin's son. That, that's, I, I always answered to Tom Peaslin's son for many, many years because that's who I was. I was the missionary's son, as, as all MKs are used, to, are used to doing. Elisha was that way. He, he didn't even have his own name for people to call him. They called him Elijah's servant. He was in Elijah's shadow. The New Testament recognizes Elijah as important. So Elisha did two times the miracles, did two times the time, right? But Elijah is the one that gets mentioned 29 times in the New Testament and alluded to various other times. He actually gets to show up in the New Testament, we heard this morning. And yet Elisha is only mentioned once, and that in reference to the story of the Gentile, Naaman. Elisha played a subordinate role, didn't he? Yet, Elisha is a beautiful type of Christ. And that'll be for a message of a different time. But if you, if you take some time and look through the life of Elisha and look at the life of Christ, there's just some beautiful comparisons between those two lives. Going back to some, some lessons that we can take from these, Elisha 
was standing on big shoulders, wasn't he? He was stepping into some big shoes. He was this quiet introvert coming into this role of this flamboyant, boisterous, loud, outspoken prophet. And the mantle fell on him to be his replacement. And I can almost hear Elisha saying, that's not me. I mean, I, I can't do that. And I stand on, on Mount Carmel and call out and shout out. There's many lessons to learn from a disciple fashioned each of us for a unique role. And sometimes, even though that role is the same, the way we do it will look different. We look at Elijah and Elisha, and we look at them. It's clear from Scripture, the Lord told Elijah, you will anoint Elisha to be your predecessor, the, the, your successor, sorry. Um, he will follow you up. He will be the next prophet. So it was of God. God was saying he will fill your shoes, even though Elijah probably was pretty sure he couldn't. And Elisha was probably... pretty sure he couldn't and prepared him for a unique role in his service. Their key differences, drastic differences, were suited to these to this same role, but to be used in different ways to call a nation back to God from the brink of apostasy. So Elijah's bold personality and dramatic miracles, they were needed to call a nation back to God from this apostasy that they'd gone into they they didn't even remember god anymore and elijah's bold statements and fire from heaven and these the drought that got the attention of the entire nation god used for that purpose but yet elisha's compassionate one-on-one -on -one, one to two to three people miracles were a needed reminder of god's faithfulness of god's grace even when they were unfaithful to him. I love Elisha. I love the, the ministry that he has with these small, we could say small individuals, obscure individuals in the kingdom at this time. You know, God, God's a sculptor. He's fashioning each one of us. He's, he takes each one of our lives and he suits us for the significant work he has planned. He doesn't suit me to your work. He suits me to the work he has for me. And he did that in the life of a life. Elisha and Elijah. Personality, body type, talents, experiences, the time and place in which we live. Those things God So after that brief review of who these two guys are, let's, let's dig into the transition. 2 Kings chapter 2, if you're still there. 2 Kings chapter 2, I want to read a few verses. We, for the sake of time, I won't read through the entire, but let's start there at chapter 2, verse 1. To take Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven. So end of ministry for Elijah that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. He said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, so they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophet who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know, be still. I think that was the tone he used. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be still. 
Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he, Elisha, said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them, um, now the fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what will be for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and he returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. So Elijah, this prophet, is wrapping up his ministry. His name is, uh, means God is Jehovah, and his message was one God over Israel. He made that very clear with all of his miracles, and in his public ministry, we could call him the prophet of fire and of rain. And he's given a grandiose exit. It fits his ministry, doesn't it? Elisha, his name, means God is salvation. And he has much more private ministry, as I've mentioned. And he has, so whereas Elijah has this message of righteousness and justice and judgment, Elisha has more of a message of grace. A, method, a message of faithfulness, not deserved. Those that he comes to help and, in, in, and has relation with definitely didn't deserve God to be gracious to them, but that's what grace is all about, and hence Elisha being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see this cycle in this transition in the passage that we've just read where Elijah speaks, Elisha responds, then the prophets or the son of the prophets speak, and Elisha responds to them. And it happens twice that way. And then the third time, the, the prophets don't speak. They just watch. When, when Moses this final trip together, the final hurrah of their discipleship. But they move from there. It's interesting to see as Elijah multiple times tells Elisha, stay here. And Elisha just says, no. This is a, a difficult passage to understand. Elisha is the disciple, right? So we would expect the student to be submissive and to obey and to listen to the teacher when the teacher says, hey, you stay here, I'm going on, stay here. Elisha doesn't say, yes, sir. He goes, no, no, I will continue on. Does it help us understand why this happens? Is he being rebellious? Is he just pushed back? Where upon authority? What is what is going on here? We move the passage. What is happening? 
But they go from Gilgal, this this place of consecration of mantle, which means the God, Jacob, God speaks to us. Set up here a gold in this house, God, for the people who worship there. It could be a representation of us of, of the worldly society in which we live. field here for you there's ministry to be done there is a need you need to stay here and Elisha says no as long as as long as you live I'm, I'm sticking with you it's almost as if he's waiting something he needs something to carry on this ministry and it's an important reminder that need does not always equal a call so they go on together a place to go, a place pleasantness, but yet a place destroyed as the, the people can harm the land. There are those living there, and there's another school in there. time studying the word of god but not really experiencing a relationship what did god want to do in this place he had cursed it it was not for to be a place of blessing but yet they were there supposedly studying to be prophets and one conversation takes place and elisha says no i, I i'll carry on there was much need there but elisha says i i must go with you Elisha refuses to give up, turn back without, and I believe this is the reason why he will, the reason he will stay, he will now for the blessing. To go to the end with Elijah, the double spirit. Yes. They can run to the Jordan, which is a type of death. And they pass through this as Elijah prepares to leave this in a strange and miraculous way. Warren grants the wish, the desire, the request of Elisha when he begs to have double portion of the spirit. And to come now back to ministry, he smites the, the Jordan, the waters, and says, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? Will you be with me as you've been with, Jeremiah, with Elijah? Interesting that he goes back to the same places. Just and they want to send my men out to go searching for Elijah because it was just a tornado or something that dropped his body somewhere in the desert. And he goes, You don't need that. I know where he went. We want to do it. Okay, go, go ahead and go. And they come back. We didn't find him. Well, I knew you were going to find him. But there's a problem there at Jericho. It's a it's a land of barrenness, and there's a it's a land of need, it's a land of sin. And there's a spring of water that has, uh, we could say, poison or, or an evil, something in it that is making, making those that drink of it sick. And he 
we won't read the passage, but in the, the second portion of this chapter, Elisha tells them to take a new bowl full of salt. And he takes that and places it into the spring. And the spring is healed. And they can once, once again drink of it. A wonderful picture there of a, a new creation, something that is new, that is, that is full of salt. What does the Lord do with us? He takes us and he, he, he takes us through death, right? Death to sin. And he takes us and makes us a new creation. And he asks us to be the salt of the earth. And Elisha carries on to Bethel. And there, as I mentioned earlier, these youths mock and the, the, the bears come out and, and maul these 42. God will not be mocked. So why do I tell these stories? Why, do I, why, do we, why spend time in this passage? Well, what I'd like each one of us to ask ourselves this morning is, who are you? Who, who am I in this story? Are you Elijah? Uh, have you been that one that has been faithfully proclaiming the truths of God for years and that are nearing the time to, to get close to Jordan and to cross over? But have you taken on a disciple yet? Has the Lord brought to your attention those that would be carrying on the ministry that you have carried on over these years? Or are you Elisha? Are you, are you the younger generation that are, that are looking to get involved and to pick up a ministry and need someone to disciple and show you the way? Are you the leading or the following generation? Are you a proclaimer like Elijah? Or maybe you're a come-along come cider. Yeah, I made that word up. One that comes alongside just individual one, two people to touch their lives as the Lord might direct. Now, let's not judge another generation's, another generation's methods or personalities or means. I'm sure it would have been easy for Elijah to look at Elisha and go, man, you're, you're not cut out for this. I mean, you just don't have what it takes. You, you've you've got to be bold. You've got to be able to stand up and take it and talk loud. And Elijah goes, that's eh, not me. But did Elijah know how God was going to use Elisha in personal ways, coming alongside different ones? Or Elisha could look at Elijah and go, oh man, you need to tone it down. You're, you're quite loud. You're kind of offensive, you know? God used each one according to his plan. And he will do so in our lives as well. So, so let's not be critical of how the Lord is using others' personalities or others' methods, obviously within the boundaries of Scripture that God has given to us. You know, as I consider these things, I, I look at some of the generations of old, and one of, the, one of my reasons for, for studying some of these passages has been that as we've considered at CMML the, the 100th anniversary, and we've looked past at these, these stories of the 100 years, I, you look at some of these lives and go, man, God could never use me as he used him or her. You look at these individuals, and great men and women of God that were used mightily, that gave their lives, sometimes in death and sometimes in life, but God used them. And I compare myself to them and I say, well, we're in a different class. This is a total different category, Lord. You, I don't think you can use me like you use them. Does Elisha say that? Elisha could have said the same thing, but no. He says, give me that spirit. Give me double of that spirit and I'll take it on. Now, he did it in a very different way. Ways, and, he did it in a, and the Lord used it in drastically different means. But he was faithful. All he wanted was to have the Spirit of God. The Spirit that had been in Elijah, he wanted a double portion. Lord, give me a double portion of that Spirit. Use me like you used him. Is that our desire today? 
You know, as I look at that past generation and I think of individuals like a George Verwer or a George Whitfield further back or the Wesleys or Palau or Billy Graham and these, these individuals that rubbed shoulders with presidents and spoke to multitudes and filled stadiums and I go, that's not me. That doesn't have to be you. God wants to use you. He wants to use me. And he will give us of that spirit. But we must be faithful in the ministry he's called us to. Whatever that is. And for most of us, it's going to be the come alongsiders. It's going to be the, yeah, maybe not up in front of the crowd, but just faithfully being a friend to everyone around us. That when my neighbor needs help, I'm there for him. And I share the gospel and I show the love of Christ to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our family members. Yeah, most of us aren't calling down fire from heaven. But we are called upon to speak the word of God to those around us. Do you desire a double portion of the spirit of God? Or, or are you just happy to, to be here? You know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay in Gilgal. <laughs> I'm not gonna follow you to Bethel and Jericho and through the Jordan. And, can you imagine if, if Elisha had missed all of that and had not seen all of that? He would have missed out on that double portion of spirit. He would have missed out in seeing the hand of God, and most likely the Lord wouldn't have used him as he did. Where is the God of our forefathers? Who, who is that one that you look back to? Like Elisha would look back to Elijah. You go, yeah, that, that individual. I look back at individuals like my grandfather, and I say, Give me double portion of the spirit of God that was in him. Give me double portion of the spirit of God that was in Jim Elliot. That's what I want. Now, does that mean God is going to use me in the exact same way? Has he made me an exact replica of those in it? No. He wants to use me, though. If I'm willing. If I'll let him. Are you willing to strike the water, to take up that mantle and strike the water and say, where is the God of my forefathers? Or will you just stand there and go, eh, maybe I'll try to swim across. Or maybe I'll just stand, stay on this side. Strike the water. Have a desire of a double portion. Father, Generational discipleship. What a, what a difficult thing, Father. That an older generation that knew things very differently than what we know, that experienced things very differently than what we know, that were used very differently of you than what we might be used of you. Oh, Father, help us to be faithful like Elijah and Elisha, the one being faithful to disciple, to, to bring alongside, to teach and to train and to have him tag along and learn. And the other faithfully standing in the shadows and faithfully willingly being taught, not being forced to follow the same methods and means, being led to know the same God and to see the same God work in his life. And obviously, learning to have a desire for that same spirit to be at work in him. Father, this morning I would pray that each one of us, regardless of our generation, regardless of our age, our lives, Father, if there's anyone here that, that isn't even on the team yet, if isn't part of the family yet, that you would be at work in them and understand that you want to work in their lives, that you want to save them from sin and give them carry on in this journey. Father, we're probably not crossing Jordans and and seeing calling fire down from heaven, but you want us to be involved in the lives of those around us. So Father, help us to be disciplers 
and to be disciples and to be used to touch the lives of those around us, I pray. We do desire a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of God that was at work in Elijah. And Father, as we go about our lives, may we proclaim, where is the God of our forefathers? Where is the God of Elisha? May he be at work in my life today. May I be willing to strike the water and to see you work. I ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Mm-hmm.